Chris Nagua, he's America's number one money mentor. He's managed over $30 million in assets. He also specializes in retirement strategies and wealth accumulation. He's a founder and CEO of Thanks. Flip Out Academy, and he's used money multiplier strategies to buy real estate. So let's please put our hands together for Mr. Chris Nagel. <laughs> Chris, I'm excited for this. All right, all right, all right. I'm gonna I'm gonna start, folks, real quick with handing some things out. So Hannah has just a brochure, and we did this. It's kind of just a magazine, so we're gonna get that out. And I'm always a fan of giving stuff out. But before I start, you guys mind if I play a video? Is that all right? All right, let's do it. Chris Noggle is a nationally recognized entrepreneur from Western New York. In his 16 years of high-level experience in the financial services and advisory industry, he has managed over $30 million in assets, specializing in alternative investments, retirement strategies, and wealth accumulation. Using his expert knowledge in finance, he has successfully bought, renovated, and flipped hundreds of properties. Through his passion and success at real estate, Chris and his wife Larissa's renovation designs have been featured on HGTV's House Hunters, My Lottery Dream Home, and their very own show, Risky Builders. But where it all began was a 16-year-old with a t-shirt company in his mom's basement. A dream of becoming a professional snowboarder, owning a skateboard shop at age 17, and a lot of imagination. Here he is. Welcome to the stage, Chris Noggle. All right. I am so, so excited to be here today that I'm going to open up with Get this because I want you to laugh. I'm not thinking with you, not you, not you. Nope, nope. I'm going to be my own bank. I'm not banking with you. Uninterrupted compound interest. Start your infinite banking policy today. Bye-bye, big banks. So, all right, there's the intro. I am so excited. You know, it's, it's been a long year and a half or however long this whole thing's been going on. And, you know, I used to speak on stages three out of every four weeks in a month. It was crazy. And that was just the only life I knew. And then COVID hits, and then all of a sudden I had to reinvent and pivot everything we did and take it virtual. How many of you have seen any of my stuff on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube by a show of hands? Awesome. So most of you haven't. That means this is going to be good. Did you guys like what Brent did earlier? You guys like that presentation? So what if I just took what Brent did, the BYOB, I call it. What, what, when I say BYOB, what does that mean? Bring your own bottle, bring your own beer. Be your own bank. That's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to show you some advanced strategies. So you guys got to go back to what Brent taught because it's very important that you remember some of what he showed you to really grasp what I'm going to show you. Because I'm going to I'm going to go ten layers deep. But before I do that, we got about eighty people in here. Okay, so I need five percent. So Chuck, can I have you stand up? Uh, Suzanne, can I have you stand up? Someone in the back, at, uh, right over here. Okay, now we're, you are a ranger, right? Doesn't matter. Thank you for your service. And I need uh, one more person. To, yep, one more. All right, so we got four standing up right now. I want everybody to look at these four standing. They represent 5% of this room, give or take. And these five, according to the Social Security Administration, will be the only, or I'm sorry, these four will be the only four that are successful at the age of retirement. Statistically. These are your successful retirees. So put your hands together with them. And I like rewarding people for success. And I like rewarding them with money. So I know it's, there you go. There you go. There you go. And one more. There you are. All right. You guys can sit down. But seriously, think about that right now. Only four out of this room, or only five out of 100, are going to be financially secure at the age of retirement. Isn't this the United States of America? Okay, the greatest country on earth, the land of opportunity. How the hell can that be? There's a big problem. And you know, what I see is I see a lot of retirees getting to the retirement age, and they're going to be working into retirement, not because they want to, but because they have to. 
But here's the thing. That isn't any of you. You are all now the 5%. I need you to, your mindset to be that you are the 5%. You are going to be the ones that are going to be financially successful. Can anyone tell me for a book why this room will be the 5%? There's one thing you all do different than every one of those 95 percenters. What is it? Okay, you're here? Keep going. Just blurt it out. I'll, I'll know it. No, it starts with a C. Let's try that. No. Nope. Nope. Here, all right, let me just give it, and I'll give the books away later. Don't worry. It's called creation. Creation. If we took 120-year-olds, and we went around and we asked them all one question, and that is, will you be successful at the age of 65? What would they say? Before I even said that, they'd be like, of course I will. Chris, why would you ask me that question? Every one of them. Fast forward to 65. That statistic is real. Only five of those 100 20-year-old ambitious kids will be successful by the numbers. The difference, and there's only one difference, is 95 of them conformed to what somebody else told them their life should be, to what somebody else said they should do. Five of them created their financial destiny. Five of them created financial security, financial freedom. Five of them decided that money was their permission slip. You are all the 5%. Can you guys agree with that? You are the 5%. Does anyone else here want to be 95%? Okay, because if you do, there's the door. You are the 5%. So let's get into this. We already heard the story, but I'm going to go a little deeper into that because, you know, to tell the story sometimes is what hooks somebody because there's similarities. I grew up in a lower, lower middle class family. My mom raised me exclusively. Dad was an alcoholic. It was a huge financial struggle for her. Now, I know that's not the norm for most people, but how many of you know somebody that grew up and struggled financially? Almost everybody, right? That was me. And even though that was my life, it was fine because I just had to do what everybody else was unwilling to do. And one of my dreams as a kid was I wanted to be a snowboarder. You saw the video? So I went out there and I did what everybody was unwilling to do. And things were going great. I started my first business in mom's basement at 16 called Fat Clothing Company. It was a clothing line. The only function of that clothing line was so that I actually had money to travel for snowboarding. At 17, in traveling, I saw, uh, I saw my next dream. I saw shops, shop owners, people that own stores, and I'm like, that's what I want. How many of you have ever seen something and you're just like, I need that? Okay. Out of those that you just raised your hands, how many of you actually went out and took action to get that? Good for you. Good for you. I just went out and I said, I want that, and I wasn't going to stop until I got it. But I almost did. You see, during that process, I almost lost that dream because I went around and I asked everybody for money. I needed $70,000 at 17. That's a tough task. From a kid that grew up with nothing and had no family with money, I asked everybody and they all said, no, hell no, absolutely not. My dad said, go get a job at the factory, son. I'll show you the way you can work 30 years, get a pension, and life's good. I almost gave up. And you know, the one person that I relate my success to is my unconditional one. Who can tell me who my unconditional one is? Your wife. No, my mom. Hmm? My mom, when I was 17, saw this happening. She saw the fact that I was giving up on that dream, and she said, you know what? Yes, exactly. I don't want you to give up on your dream. I don't have $70,000, but I have the house, which is the only thing my mom had, a two-bedroom, 700-square-foot ranch in Lockport, New York, and she put that house that she got in the divorce up for collateral so her punk snowboard kid right there could chase his dream. Now, looking back at that, that was a stupid, foolish thing of my mom to do because I could have very easily failed, and there goes the house, and I, I don't know if I could have lived with myself. Well, obviously, that's not what happened. I went on, and we'll fast forward now to the early 2000s. I went on to have success with those stores. Life was great. I was a pro snowboarder running the shops. It was like a fairy tale. Then the dot-com crash hit. And when that hit, I had some decisions to make. I can watch my business go down and do nothing about it, or I can go out there and get a job. Now, at 16, I decided to stop trading hours for dollars, but now again, I'm faced with that reality of i got to get a job. I was either going to deliver pizzas with my friend Mike at Little Caesars, true story, or I was going to get a real job. And guess where I landed? Wall Street. What the hell does a snowboarder 
have any business being in Wall Street. None. That's just who called me. And I ended up going out there and they did. How many of you have ever seen the movie Boiler Room? Remember the part at the table where he slides the keys across the table? This dude watched that movie and did that. And I'm like, ooh, that's a Ferrari. <laughs> I was sold. And I entered Wall Street. And you know what? At first, it was supposed to be a temporary thing, but it ended up being a permanent thing, and I loved it. I became one of the top advisors for some big firms like Eagle Strategies, New York Life, Charles Schwab. And that was going great. And, and up through the 2000s, I was crushing it. I was making a lot of money. It's when I was uh, 2006, it was, I decided to flip my first house. And then 2007, I did it again. In 2008, I bought a dilapidated paint store, and I said, you know, I'm going to develop this. I'm going to turn it into three units. I'm going to move my store in there, and I'm going to stop paying somebody else rent and let everybody else pay me rent. Sounds smart, right? When did I just say I did that? You guys remember that? You know, how many times in your lives have you thought your life was going to go one way, and then all of a sudden it's going the complete opposite way? Well, that was me. 2008 hit me like a Mack truck like a Mack truck, it brought me to my knees so bad that I was one payment away from not being able to pay this hard money lender his money back. But this wasn't any hard money lender. This was a hard money lender that you don't want to borrow money from because they don't just take the property back. You know, a couple fingers, wrist, you know, hand, whatever. I remember one night coming home to my, well, she's my wife now, but she was my girlfriend at the time, and I looked her in the eye and I said, sweetie, I need your help. I need your help paying the mortgage. I need your help paying the utilities. And sweetie, my friend Pete's going to move into that bedroom down the hall, and my friend Jessica's got to live upstairs. Are you okay with this? Now, I had a 50-50 shot at best of her walking out that door or staying, but I think she kind of liked me. She ended up sticking around, and we made it through that. And into the 2009 on, from 9 to 14, all I did is what Warren Buffett said. Can anyone tell me Warren Buffett's three rules to investing? What are they? That's rule number three. What was the first? Don't lose the money? And don't lose money. Buy cheap. Okay, buy low. Rule number two. Sell high. Sell high and don't lose money. Buy low, sell high, and don't lose money. You guys should all write that down. If you've got a pen, put that on the paper. Simple rule. Buy low, sell high, don't lose money. So I started buying apartment buildings. Real estate was on sale in 2009. So I went out and I used the same community bank that I was using for my strip mall, because I did get out of that mess, and I bought, I got up to 36 units by 2014. I was doing well. I was almost back. I took my 37th unit to that same community bank and they looked at it and they said, Mr. Noggle, you don't fit in our little square box. And that little square box is called debt to income. And I'm just like, what, what is that? I, I pay my bills, I have income, I, yeah, I got a lot of debt. And they say, yeah, we can't give you the mortgage. They said, darn it, no house. Okay, great. Then they froze my lines of credit. And those lines of credit are what I used to actually do my, my rental re renovations. That's the only money I had to do it. I had no other money. As soon as they did that, game over. And then I got behind on my mortgages. And what do they do when you get behind? They call them. It's a commercial mortgage. They call the mortgages. And they did that. All 36 units, I had to sell them all. I had to sell the dream house that me and Larissa had bought, and I was right back at the bottom. You guys see what happened here? It's a roller coaster, right? The up, the down, the up, the down. We all ride this roller coaster because we're all subscribing to a big fucking lie. Excuse my language, but we are. It's a lie. Money and the truth about how money works is not what we're taught about money. We are taught the complete opposite because it's beneficial for everybody else. You all need to learn to take back control of your money, and that's exactly what I'm going to show you to do, because I had to learn it the hard way. You do not. I went to a three-day event during that hard time in my life, and I only went because they were giving away an iPod shuffle, and I had nothing to lose, but I had an iPod shuffle to gain. True story. I go there, I'm sitting in the back, Mr. Big Financial Advisor, watching everybody speak, and then two guys get on the stage, Mike and Greg. And Brent alluded to the, the Mike that I'm talking about. He had a TV show, Flipman. And they get up there, and they're talking about money, and I'm thinking, I'm like, Oh my God, these guys are talking about money completely different than anything I'd ever heard as an advisor. They were doing everything the complete opposite of what I'd been taught to do as a high level advisor. I'm just like, what is this? So I dove in and I swiped my credit card, I maxed it out, and I started following these guys around. And that led to following more wealthy people and multimillionaires and billionaires. And I got in the same rooms and I asked them all, what is it that you do with money? How do you handle money? Are you doing the same things Mike and Greg are doing? And you know what I found? They all were. Every one of them was doing the same thing 
with money, but nobody ever talks about these things. These are like what they call the secrets of the wealthy, right? Why we call mapping out the millionaire mystery, because it really is. We're not taught these things. It is a shame. And I've literally made it my mission from that point to actually go out there and teach people the truth, not the lies, about how money works. You're in the right room because everything you're hearing today, a lot of this stuff you're hearing is stuff they won't teach you. Did anyone learn that in school? No, you learned how to be an employee at school. College, you learned how to work for somebody else, maybe a little bit about working for yourself, but it was always focused on you trading hours for dollars, which puts a ceiling on your ability to earn money. Do you guys want a ceiling on your ability to earn money? Then change how you do things. Stop working for money and start learning how to make your money work for you. And I'm going to show you how to do that. But a lot of people, when I say that, they tune out. They're like, if I only had money, then I could do that. You know where your money is? In somebody else's bank. Every month, you write checks to somebody else. You give your wealth away. We need to take that back. We need to take back the wealth that you give away. So let me start showing you how this works. You guys, I'm not going to go into this. You already saw this with Brent. But does everybody understand what the bank did in this example here? They just moved money, did they not? Yeah. Do you realize you can do the exact same thing? So let me show you how you can do the exact same thing. This is the flow of your money, your bank. This is exactly what Brent was showing you. I'm just going to go a layer deeper, but I'm going to do it in a unique way. I'm going to show you one of my policies. Brent has 19. He's my mentor. I have seven. I'm trying to catch up. It's a, t it's a tall task. It really is. Trying to catch up, but it takes money to catch up to that. And all I have to do is go out there and make my money work harder. Now, how many of you own a house in here? Okay, awesome, okay. How many of you right now have a mortgage on that house that's older than seven years and you never refinanced it? See, that number dropped significantly. One thing about your house, how many of you have equity in your house? Wow, most of the room. And that's normal, right? Isn't, hasn't the real estate market been good? That's why you guys are in real estate. The market's really good. You're making a lot of money, or are you? Because you know what your money's doing? If you've, who, everybody in here has equity in their house. Out of everybody that has equity, how many of you have a home equity line of credit? The number dropped significantly. I'd have to ask why. Why don't you have one? What you're doing, I want paint this picture right now. You, you go out and you work a really long, hard day. You come home after that hard day, you're exhausted. It's late at night, the kids are in bed. You open the door and you look over in your living room and right there on your couch is your money. Your money's sitting on your couch, TV's blaring, it's got potato chips all around, eating your potato chips, drinking your soda. Someone said they love soda. Your money's drinking your soda. Your money is sitting on your couch being lazy while you're out working. And all you need to do is walk up to your money and say, you know what, money? Get out of that couch. You're going to go to work tomorrow. You're never going to come home. And you know what your money will do? Thank you. Your money will thank you. Because your money wants to work for you, but you've got to tell it what to do. So we've got to tell it how to flow. So here's how you flow it. We already talked about one change that you have to make, and that's where the money goes first, right? Where was Brent telling you to put the money? Whole life. All oh, those stupid whole life policies that Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman said are terrible it's because they're talking about regular whole life. We're talking about a specially designed and engineered whole life. So I'm going to call that the TMM policy, the, the money multiplier policy. This is where your money starts. One change, okay? Now here's what we're going to do. This $23,000 loan is the first year of my policy. And what did I do with that money? Now, does everybody understand the segregated account or should I explain that again? Explain, explain it. All this segregated account is, is how many of you have a checking account? That is what your segregated account is. Imagine that, simple. But this segregated account isn't the checking account that you write checks out of every month. It isn't the checking account that your husband, your wife write their checks out of. This is a new one. Does it cost anything to open a new checking account at your bank? Doesn't that look good when you go in and you open a new checking account? Your bank loves it. You build a relationship. Maybe even if you don't have a checking account at a community bank, this would be the opportunity. Go open a new checking account. That's all this is. Why do we want a segregated account? There's only one reason we do this. Books and records. We want to track our money in and we want to track our money out. Isn't that what a bank does in their back office? Don't they track your loan, your loan payments, the loan interest payments, everything like that? You need to do the same thing, but it's so easy. Just open a new checking account. Okay, so that's, everybody got that, right? That's the segregated account. So this $23,000 loan that I took out of my policy in the first year, actually immediately, it was like before 30 days. I took 23 grand out 
and I had a purpose for it. I never just take money out of my plan for no reason. I take it out because I have a destination for that money. I have somewhere for that money to go to work. And you know where that money was? My key bank line of credit. See, I have a line of credit. How many of you have one? They're, they're giving them out like candy if you don't have one yet. Just go down to the bank and it's like, you know, it's like a Pez container. They just give them to you. <laughs> so I had a line of credit, but the line of credit was costing me interest. 9% is what they dinged me. It was a non or an unsecured line of credit. They were charging me 9%. So wouldn't it just make sense if I had 23 grand in my banking policy and I owe KeyBank 23 grand to pay KeyBank off? Now I don't owe KeyBank any money. But the problem with that is, is then I need to go one more step. Because every month I used to give KeyBank $289. That was the minimum payment. And how many of you know how they work? If you make a minimum payment on a credit card or a line of credit, how long does it take to pay it off? Never. Infinite, right? Yeah. You never do. So that would have been never paying off this line of credit. So I did, and I did this. I paid off that line of credit, and I changed one thing, the name on the check. You see, it used to say KeyBank, and now it says the Bank of Noggle. And all I did is I put that check back in my account. In doing so, I moved my money. Now, many of you are probably going to say, yeah, but I don't have debt. Awesome. We're going to get into that. Because what I'm going to cover with you today is I'm going to show you how to move your money the way I have, the way I am with one of my seven policies. I'm going to show you how to use it in real estate. I'm going to show you how to use it the way I do for private lending. Okay? Awesome, awesome way to move money. Then I'm going to show you, Brent showed you how to get all the money back for the cars. That was pretty cool, right? How many of you would like to drive a company car for free? Yeah? You guys like that? I'm going to show you how to do that. Really easy strategy. So let's get into the returns, though, because you know what? What Brent's presentation doesn't do is show you the numbers. Now, how many of you like numbers? There's the, where's the guy that did that? Yeah, the compound interest guy right back here. What's your name, sir? Scott? Scott, now I know they rewarded you already, but what I'm going to start doing for participating is I'm going to start rewarding you. So can somebody pass this back to Scott? I've got some books mapping out the millionaire mystery. That was awesome that he took the time to go figure that out. You see, compound interest is something that we all think we understand, but we really don't. You know who did understand it? Albert Einstein. You guys may know who he is, right? That guy with the crazy hair with the, the tongue. That guy? Yeah. Okay. He said, compound interest is the most powerful thing in the universe. He said, it's the eighth wonder of the world. Those that understand it, earn it. Those that don't, pay it. So what we have to look at is, what does that look like? Here's my policy, 30000 for the first five years. Okay? There's my guaranteed cash increase. I want everybody to look at this number. I put in 30 in the fifth year. I can take out 33. Okay? That is a $3,028 gain on my money, and I had access to this money every step of every day in this existence. But, see, that's the return, 10.09. Then we go down one more, 29%, 143, 225, 316, 412. Those numbers are what's called cash on cash return. Does everybody know the difference between cumulative return and cash on cash return? No. Okay. No. Cash on cash in real estate. You put 100 grand into a real estate project. Okay. That 100 grand makes you a return at the end of the year of 5%. That is a cash on cash return. The next year, that 100 grand is still in your real estate deal. Okay, that's, your, that's the amount you put in. The next year, you make a little more, and now you got an 8%. That year is your cash on cash. It's the year return on your investment you put in that year only. Cumulative is the way that we've been taught. Put money in somebody else's control, the bank, the 401ks, you know, not self-directed, as I'm talking about the other ones. Okay, 401ks where somebody else is in control, they make money off of it, and we just have to leave it sit. That's lazy money. This... Cash on cash is when you have the access to the money and you can use it in and out, in and out. You take the money and you move it around the circle. And we're going to get into that. Okay? So that's cash on cash. Now, cumulative would be if I just put in this, this return and I just started adding up, this is how much I deposited and this is my return in total. Follow? So cash on cash is the most important because it shows what your money made you that year. Would you, if you had access to all of your money at all times, wouldn't it be important to make a good cash on cash return each year? Or would you prefer to just take all of your money and just park it somewhere and just leave it sit? Because I don't think that's what you do in options. Okay? I, I know that's not. That's not what you do in real estate. You move your money. You're constantly expanding your real estate portfolio. So that's the numbers. I just wanted to get this out of the way. This is important because I'm going to come back to this so everybody understands this. Right? You sure? Yeah. Okay. All right. Moving on. So here's what we're going to do. Compound interest versus regular interest in a bank. If I had 100 grand in a regular checking account, 
Okay? And I took 27,000 out of my account. There'd be $73,000 left because I got 27 grand. It's called a loan, just call it a withdrawal. That's, that's the way you all look at money, right? I have 100, I take 23 out, I'm only earning interest on 73, the amount left. Isn't that the way we always look at it from the bank? Because the bank doesn't pay you on money that's not still in your account, does it? Do you know who does? Insurance companies. Oh, yeah. You see, my money multiplier policy, I put 100 grand in that thing. I take out 27 grand, same example. The insurance company is still paying me interest and dividends on 100,000, not 73. This is the difference. This is the power. This is that secret that they don't tell you about. This is called uninterrupted compound interest. I just used this example to show it. Now we're going to get into it. Everybody here has a why, right? Why do you do what you do? You don't go to work just because. You go to work for a why. And don't tell me you go to work because you have bills to pay. That is not true anymore. You don't have to go to work at all. And your bills may get paid. You go to work because you have a why of something. This is my why. This is my little one. Ten months old now. But we're going to go through a life cycle of my banking policy. I want to show you how I use my plans so that you can see what Brent told you and you can see a path, a, a method, a, a process on how you can do this. So here we go. 87,970, okay? That number is irrelevant, but that is three years of that plan I just showed you. Three years in, I have 87. I'm going to take out, right there, I'm going to take out a loan from that plan for 25,000. Because somebody in here needs 25 grand. Who needs 25 grand in here? Oh, yeah. Huh. Whoa. Oh, yeah. God, this is going to be fun. 25 grand. All right, who wants, to be, who wants to be the guinea pig? I need one. All right, I'm going to pick on you, okay? So Scott's going to be my guinea pig. Scott needs 25,000 bucks. Yeah, play along with this. All right. Now, Scott, uh -huh. I can take 25 grand from my banking policy, and I can lend that money to you. But, Scott, you've got to pay me 12%. You still want 25 grand? Mm, no. Okay, who wants 25 grand at 12%? Pass the mic back. You're disqualified. Oh, okay. uh, just go back a couple back here. Greg? What's your name? Greg. 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 Okay, Greg wants 25 grand at 12%. Now, Greg is obviously going to make more than 12%, which is why he's willing to pay me that absorbent rate. And is 12% is out of line for hard money lending or private lending? No, it's in line. Like that, it. It, That's about what you're going to pay with points. I'm just he charging 12%. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give him a loan at 12%. And he's going to buy real estate or something, and he's going to pay me a return. And how much is that return? It's going to be, clicker. Thanks, guys. No, I got it. They got it for me. Remember, we've got to be cool. Yeah. Guys, right? We've got to be cool. When things don't work, we've got to be cool. And maybe in the bat, there we go. All right, so he's going to pay me 250 bucks a month. So you're okay paying me 250 a month while I give you the 25 grand? Awesome. So he's okay with that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that 250 and I'm going to put it in my segregated account. Books and records. Only reason. Okay. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make 145.83 net. That's my return that I make. Now why am I not making 250? Anyone know why? Right. For me to take money out of my policy, the insurance company is going to charge me simple, I want to be clear about that, simple interest of 5%. So there's a cost for me using my own money. And the insurance company just gave me the money from their general account so that my money, all 87,000, stays in my account, earning a guaranteed 4% plus dividend. In this company, it's 6% all in, okay? So my 87 is making 6%. The insurance company is charging me five on 25. I charge Greg 12. My net is 145. Pretty good return, right? And then what I'm gonna do when he pays me off, I'm gonna put the money back in, Greg. Do you want another loan? Yes. You do? Okay. How much do you need? How about you need 50? Sure. Greg needs 50,000. Yeah, 50. Why? Why 25, man? Let's up the ante, man. Nicer property, whatever it is you want. We're going to do 50 grand. But now, see, we're in year five. Two years have gone by. Greg comes back and says, Chris, man, I got this great opportunity. I need 50 grand. I said, perfect. I got 152. I will take a loan for 50 grand, and I will give it to Greg. But see, now I like Greg. Now I got trust of Greg. He paid me back. He even every time, write this down, every time, every month when he made that $250 check, he took a picture of it, and he texted it to me. Do you think that would be helpful to build a relationship with a private lender? Wouldn't that feel good? Like for me being the lender, I don't even know what's coming. Greg texts me a photo of a check he's mailing to me. I'm like, heck yeah, man. Greg, you go, buddy. Next time is going to be more than 50. So now 
I lend it to him at 9% because I like Greg. I built a relationship. This is a relationship business. You see how this is going? Okay. The better you are with handling other people's money, the more money you can get, the lower the rate goes. That's how it exactly works. I'm a private lender. I lend a lot of money. And I, the people that are good like that, that and that's a real example, Greg, of somebody sending me a photo, I will take less because I have less risk and I have more trust. So 9%, so he's going to give me 375 bucks a month, okay? And out of that 375, I'm going to net 166.67 because I had to give 5% of that nine back to the insurance company. Everybody follows? Then Greg yes. pays me off, okay? He gets his deal done, doesn't want to pay me 9%. Thank you, Greg. And I'm going to give Greg a book. Thank you for participating. And I'm going to keep doing that with different examples. But you see, the next participation is my wife, and she's not here. So we can't do that. So now I can go one more year, year seven. And this is a true story that you're going to see in a little bit. Year seven, I've got 218000 in my plan. Okay, 218. And remember, I made money off of Greg twice. Because remember, he took two loans. So that interest we haven't even talked about yet. Now I take a loan for 63000 from my policy. Now, women in the room, can you all correct me or can you tell me if I was completely like taken on this one? My wife told me when she was pregnant that husbands, good husbands, she made it clear, good husbands, are supposed to do something like a push gift. Yes. So she wasn't taking advantage of me and she needed a truck, right? She needed a new vehicle. So she said that would be a great push gift. Okay, so this is real. Men take notes, take notes. Push gifts are real. So what I did is I bought my wife a Porsche, okay, 63 grand. And I'll, let me just give you the example. How many men, okay, women, I'm going to take you out. Now, men, how many men like going to the dealerships and negotiating for cars? Isn't that shit fun? Man, that's good. You sit down, you're negotiating. Nope. You know, the piece of paper, you slide that piece of paper back. Do better than that. Go back to that manager. I played that game with this car, pushing it back, sliding it back, pushing it back. Finally, he came back with the financing number I liked. And that financing number, and I'm just going to put it on the screen here real quick, was a 4.5% loan, and it was $1,175. bucks. i am like, all right, now we got it. Let's do this deal. The dealer slides the paperwork over to sign for the loan. I said, I don't, no, 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 I don't, I'm paying cash. And he looks at me strange, and I knew the guy, and he says to me, he says, well, why did you make me go back and forth, back and forth? And I said, because I needed to know how much money to pay my bank back, and I figured you'd just do the work for me. <laughs> True st Listen, I'm not making this story up. I really did this, okay? And that was 1175 So now the loan is four and a half, but remember the, the money cost me 5%. There's an important takeaway here. Can anyone tell me what the takeaway is? Why would this still make sense? Because if you're just doing regular math, I'll get to that and you're going to get the question. If I'm paying five and I'm borrowing at four and a half, like aren't I losing money? Why? Give the man a book. You're absolutely correct. All right, so what I did... And, and this is still in motion. So now we're going into the future. Once 1,175 goes back every month, I pay the loan back to myself. So remember, I'm paying a, a balance down too. So now I'm making more every payment. Now this 1,175. If I wanted this car for my wife for a push gift, and I did it the old-fashioned way, who gets that money? It would the bank that they were negotiating is called M&T Bank. They would have gotten that money, gone for my family forever. I just changed one thing, and that money now went back to me. And in doing that, I end up making. $7,471 of money I would have given to somebody else. How many, would you, how many of you would like doing that? Taking back the money you just give away to somebody else, and my wife's happy. That's the most important thing. My wife's happy. She's got her push gift. All right, so that was pretty cool, right? That was three, five, and seven years of this plan. Now, did everybody find out that you know, the returns I made in interest, do you remember that 250? And then how much was it you were paying me on that 50 grand? Do you remember? Okay, 375 every month, and, and then the car I took back 7,000. But you know what? Is that all the money I made? No, because my money never left my account. So in year three, my 30 grand I put in that year made 896, or whatever that is, 11.99. Year five, the 30 I put in made 3,000, and year seven it made 3609. That's on top of what I just showed you. See, I made money twice. I made money off of Greg. I made money off of buying my wife a push gift, and I made uninterrupted compound interest the entire time. Yes? I don't. You'd have to ask. You'd have to ask a woman. 
I don't think it's what you're thinking. Because if it was, I would have much, much more enjoyed the vehicle purchase. It's the deli delivery of Vivi. Yeah, that was the push gift. I know where he was going with that. Well played, well played. So I made all of this money on top of everything else. And that's kind of, when I first saw this, this is what I looked like. Not really, but close, right? We kind of tried finding somebody that looked like me. My mind was blown. All right, so now let's fast forward a little. Okay, private money deals. Now those private money deals where I was lending Greg money, could that not have been your own real estate deal? Yeah. Right? That, if this was your bank, could you have just skipped me? Because Greg doesn't have to pay me 12% and then 9%. He could have just done the same thing I just did and funded his projects with his own money, right? I just want you to think. I, I showed private lending because that's what I do. I lend money. But when I was doing real estate, when I was buying those, those houses, we used to do, we did 263 flips in the time that we were doing it. We had one point where we were doing 20-some flips a month. Anyone in here a flipper? Can I give you some advice? Don't ever do that. Don't, you'll, 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 I don't care how much you exercise, you will have a short life. You will. <laughs> Promise. So just follow what they're teaching about real estate and do that. And if flipping's part of it, just kind of make that just a small little piece of what you do. Just words of wisdom. That's all I'm trying to do. But now we're going to go to year 11. Year 11, I was used to putting 30000 into my plan. And remember habits. When you get in the habit of working out, when you get in the habit of doing something, what do you do? You don't really think about it anymore. You just do it. I was used to putting 30000 into this plan because I'd done it for 10 years. In the 11th year, the damn insurance company tells me I can't put thirty grand in anymore, and I'm pissed. I'm used to putting thirty in, and they say, nope, Chris, there's this thing called the IRS MEC 7 pay rule. You can only put twelve grand in. Now I'm upset, but I'm used to saving thirty. so am I going to just start putting twelve in, or am I going to keep putting thirty in? Correct. So just to keep things simple for today, let's just say that that 18 that used to go to the insurance company now is just going to go into my segregated account. In real theory and in real practice, I would open a second banking policy trying to catch up with Brent. But here, I just want to keep this simple. Everybody understands what I'm doing. 12 is going into the policy because that's all the IRS allows me to do. 18 is just the, the remaining of the 30 is going into the segregated bank account. That's it. It's just going to build up in there. Go ahead. You're, you're correct. Um, he's saying, so I'm still putting my 30 in. Yeah, simple. I just wanted to make sure you understand why I'm doing this. I'm just trying to do this as an example. Now, let me ask everybody a question. How many of you have kids? I'll come to you, Glenn, in just one sec. Okay. You all have kids. And how many of them, anyone have kids in college? Oh, wow. What does college cost these days? How much? 43. 47. Oh, God. I'm way off. All right. Because we're going to go into Vivi's college years here. Now, for college, what is the traditional thing that a financial advisor or somebody would tell you to, to do to save for college? Financial aid, okay, student loans, grants, what else? 529 plans, that's the answer I was looking for. How many of you have a 529 plan? We're conned into doing one of those. We're just gonna leave that alone because it's only one person, I won't pick on you. And I won't give you a book for that. But 529 plans are something I sold a lot of as an advisor. And you know, I always thought they were good because it gives somebody the ability to save, they can use the money tax free. When they take the money out, you know, maybe, or when you put it in, you get state tax credit. Do you get a state, state tax credit on that? Like a deduction on your state taxes? Yeah, okay, so he's getting a state tax deduction, but the problem is, is what if your daughter is, daughter or son? son. Okay, son and daughter. daughter, yes. I got a daughter too, sorry, <laughs> biased. So his daughter decides she does not want to go to school anymore. Would you be upset? Yeah. You'd be pissed, man, don't, don't lie. You'd be pissed, <laughs> you'd be like, sweetie, listen. Mommy and Daddy spent a lot of energy putting into this 529 college savings plan for you. I'd really appreciate it if you go, well, Dad, I want to be a pro surfer. What are you going to say to her? Sweetie, you can be a pro surfer after you go to school. Daddy and Mommy put a lot of money in there, and if you go to the surfing thing, then we're going to have to pay a lot of taxes here, right? What if he changed one thing and decided to put the money into here? Still tax-free when he takes it out for school. Still continue, you, make, you, you understand all that. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna fund Vivi's college. Now I got the dollar amount way off, okay? I got a lot to learn about this. I was thinking maybe 20 grand a year, 80 grand over four years. Look, look at you guys, this is funny. You guys are laughing at me. All right, so can we just go with this? Because I can't change the PowerPoint. I don't think we have time to do that. <laughs> Community college, but you see, Vivi's gonna be a pro snowboarder, or a pro surfer, so we're not gonna need this money for college. But if she does, what we're going to do is we're going to take 20 grand out, obviously going to have to go way up, 
And I'm going to assume that, what is that, 18 years from now? In 18 years from now, do you think interest rates are going to be higher or lower than they are today? Higher. higher. Now, I made an assumption that maybe if I went to take out a student loan for Vivi, it would cost 7%. Is that a pretty fair assumption, 18? How much? So I'm off on that, too. Whew. All right. I'm being schooled here. Hey, sometimes the teacher becomes the student, right? Brent taught me that. So over here, 7%. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm taking loans over there, but you see, now I got all this money sitting in that segregated account that was supposed to go into the policy, but the company wouldn't take it. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to try to find a way to move this money in somebody else's bank. I hate when somebody else has my money in their bank. I can't stand it. I've learned this. Kind of remember the backward bicycle? Once he learned how to ride that backward bicycle, he got on the regular bike and it just felt weird. Well, me putting money in a regular bank above and beyond $10,000 feels weird. So I got to get this money back. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the money that's in this segregated account because I have to move it. And hypothetically, I didn't open any more policies. I'm just going to take this 20 grand and I'm going to move it back into my plan from here over the course of those four years. Everybody understands what I did there. I'm just moving money, okay? Just, I want you to all think about this. I'm gonna pull out some more money here. I want you to think about your money, and right now your money goes into a regular bank. And from that bank, you pay bills. But at that point, when you pay the bills, that money's gone. I want you to start thinking about if you start your money here, and you move your money over to here, okay? This could be your debt, your college loans, your car payments, your credit cards, your, your mortgages, everything. You want this money to end up back over here. Okay, full circle, just think of a circle. That's all I'm trying to do is simplify what we're doing here. So all I'm trying to do is just move that money. So there's college. Got to up my numbers. Thank you. Mark made. I put $5,600 back in my pocket instead of giving it to the financial aid company or the bank that gave me the money for her. This is the money I would have given to whoever it was over here that funded her college. But if Vivi decides not to go to school, do I have to sit there and have that discussion with her? No. I can say, sweetie, where do you want to surf? Because daddy wants to surf too. Sweetie, where do you want to go snowboarding this week? Mommy won't mind. Just tell her that you and daddy are taking a trip. Those things I'm learning very quick. You see, daddy has to be the one to allow her to follow her dreams. Mommy wants to keep her nice and close. True? True or true? Got it. All right. So I'm, I'm learning, folks. I'm learning. She's only 10 months. I got 10. Oh, heck, I got lots more years left on this one. All right. Let's do a quick recap here, and then we're going to get into some fun stuff. So remember that first loan to Greg, 12%, 250, I made 3,000. Second loan I did, 50,000 at 9%. I picked up 4,500 there. Then I bought her her push gift. Maybe I got a little bamboozled on that, but in doing, no, I didn't. All right, all right. 7,471 that I would have paid to somebody else's bank, okay? And then college, I would have given someone else some interest rate. I did 7%, 5,600. So if we add all those up over here, Okay, I recaptured interest of 20571 but but there's more, plus all the interest and dividends that I was giving, or that I was making in my policy. You see, nothing really changes here from what you're doing today, except for one thing, and that's where your money goes first. Everything else that I'm showing you here are things that you're already doing. When I asked you if you had kids in school, a bunch of people raised their hand. And I, bet I just made an assumption that most of you are probably taking out some type of you know, loan or financial aid or from a savings. That's all. These are things you do every day. We're just changing one thing. That is all. Now, how many of you in here want to retire someday? Okay. Who can give me, I want to pick on one person. So who can give me the best answer of what retirement really is? Yeah, let's just say that. I like that. The freedom to do what you want when you want. It's a great answer. Here's a book. One book. Okay. The freedom to do what you want when you want. Some of you in here, when you hit retirement, you will go do the things you've always dreamed of doing. Some of you in here, like me, will continue to work because you love it, but you will work for a different cause. You'll work when you want and how you want because you want to work. You should be doing that today. Does everybody realize that? Yeah. What you do every single day should be because you love it, and because it's serving somebody else. The most powerful gift we are given on this earth is the ability to give. If you don't go to work every day, I don't care what you do, I don't care if you hate your job, if you don't go to work every day with the thought in your mind that you are helping solve somebody else's problem in one way or the other, and I don't care if you work for Amazon and you're packing boxes, what's in that box might be something that saves a child's life. 
you need to think about that every day. And I don't mean, I know that has nothing to do with this, but honestly, that is way bigger than anything I can teach you with money. Just remember that. Here's my retirement, or this is just a summary. These are just lots of numbers. This is my plan, how much it grew to, 722. These are the segregated account payments, the balance, the loans I took, and the amount I took. I just, every, there's, in every crowd or every virtual training I do, there's somebody that's a numbers person. They're just like, oh, you didn't show the numbers. That can't be. There they are, folks, right off of my illustration. So take a picture of it if you want or have fun with it. If you guys want, I'll keep it up there. I think you guys all get this anyway. Are you going to have multiple accounts that look like that? I have seven of them. No, but I mean, within, that same time, within that same time frame, are you going to have multiple life insurance policies with that cash, cumulative cash value? Yeah, I hope to have a lot more bigger than this. This is a $30,000 plan, but I want to be clear. Does it, can anyone guess for a book? And I, I got two more books. I, this is the private money guide, a book that I wrote years ago about raising private money. Can anyone guess how much I put into my very first specially designed whole life plan? How much? Two grand a year? Okay, you're close. All right, let's do monthly. How much monthly? 2000 all right, that's enough. You said two thousand. You're close. Two hundred dollars a month was my first plan. Can you pass this back to him? I want you to all to understand this thirty thousand. That's my number today. I'm doing pretty well. Okay, back when I started, I wasn't. You heard my story. All I had was two hundred bucks, and that was a struggle for me. But I started with two hundred. I got used to it. Then I moved up. My next plan was five hundred and sixty-one, and I moved up. And I keep elevating. That's like life. Your life will not always be where you want it to be today. You have to get it there. Remember Brent said, how do you get to the top of a mountain? One step at a time. Yes. Quick question with these policies, and we're all in the real estate game, and every once in a while we get big influxes of cash, right? And maybe you don't want to commit to doing a $100,000 policy this mm -hmm. year because you don't know what you're going to get next year. What do you recommend doing then? Oh, it's so easy. So imagine this policy here, 30,000 the first year, but let's just say you just flipped the house and you got, let's use 100 grand, right? You got 100 grand sitting there and you're like, man, I wish I could put there, that in, but I might not have 100 grand next year. I can do a dump in and get the insurance company to approve me to dump in 100,000 in the first year. Just one time, right? I got the money in this hand. I want to move it over to this hand because this hand pays four. This one probably pays close to nothing. You do a dump in and we get it approved by the insurance company and we can usually get you approved like when you're doing a policy for one sometimes two we hit the mech rules so that's how you would do it so every time every, if, if you do it again next year let's say next year you have another 100 grand wait hold on a second this is a good question no, so so you have another 100 grand coming next year you want to do it again do you start a new policy and then do another dump in yes sir you'd have to because at that right. first policy we set it up for right. 100 the first year and then 30,000 every year thereafter and just so everybody knows somebody asked earlier if I start a plan at 30, do I have to put 30 in? No, that's my option. My, my obligation is 12,000. Okay, I can go from 12 to 30 anytime. But next year, I can't put 100 into this plan. I'm capped. I'm maxed out. It's my ceiling, and I would max the plan if I did. So I'd start a second one. I'm going to cover a lot of questions at the end, so I'll do one more. Yes. How quickly can you start another plan, and do you want to do it quickly while you still qualify? Well, not only do you want to do it quickly while you qualify, the rules are changing. It's called 7702. Our lovely government just changed some rules. Next year, the insurance companies will be dropping the guarantee from four down to something we don't know yet. Three, three and a half. It's going to reduce. So how soon can you start your second one? Pretty much any time you want. You do your first plan, I would say within 30 to 60 days, you could start your second plan as long as you medically qualify and as long as we don't hit, I'm not going to get technical, but it's called your human life value. No. So your medical is usually good for one full year. They might ask for some things, but one full year. Let me defer out the rest because like, if I answer all the questions now, you guys are going to miss how to drive a company car and get paid for it. Okay? And you, does anyone want to miss that? No. Okay, well, let me just keep going. So Because we've got to get through retirement because we all want to retire and we already determined what retirement is going to look like. But here's 22 years into this one plan. Remember, I have seven, and I will have eight and nine and ten, and I got, I'm trying to chase Brent. My cumulative premiums I put in were 4437. I have 722. Now this is 22 years later. If you guys are in options, you're like that return sucks, right? Does anyone think that return sucks? But what if the whole time you were trading options while making that return and nothing changed? Now does that return suck? 
No. Okay, because I think um, he was making what, 3%, uh, was it a week or a month that they said? A week. a week, right? Imagine still being able to make 3% a week plus these returns. What's your retirement look like then? Let's just pretend. Okay, so here's my returns though. Cash on cash, year 12, I'm making 265000 on the 12K. I put in my cumulative return, for those of you that like being nerding out in numbers, it's only 167. For options traders, that sucks. But for a little old stupid whole life that Dave Ramsey told you was the worst place you can put your money, not so shabby. But let's look at the numbers. Here's my retirement. Truly, this is just this plan. If I, I had my money, I took it out every year. I'm gonna take 93,000 out. That's okay, right? I'm gonna have other money coming in because I'm not gonna stop. So 93,000 tax-free. Is anyone okay with that for retirement? You all should have said no. So any of you shaking your head yes, let's change that. Let's try that again. Is $93,000 enough for your retirement? Thank you, it is not. But is it a good start? Yes, yes. One, of, one of seven isn't so bad. And I'm gonna take that money out and I can do it various ways, but let's just pretend I take it as a withdrawal. I don't wanna put that money back. Remember the whole time I was moving the circle? When I retire, do I want to put the money back in? No, man, I just want to go surf. I just want to do fun things. I want to live my life. I want to give you know, 90 of the 93,000 away to charities. I want to do good things. So I'm not going to put that money back in. That's retirement. That's what it's all about. So now, if I didn't put that money back in, do you think my plan would die? There's the numbers. Now, I, I do want to cover something, because some people, every time they, cut, they try to catch me on this, Chris, if you're retired, why are you still putting 12,000 in? Is anyone thinking that? If I'm retired, why would I still want to make a $12,000 deposit into my bank? How about, how about, you know, people lie. I could give you a bunch of excuses as to why I'm doing that, but does math lie? Okay, so let's just go here, 67. I put in 12 grand, and right here. How much does that number say right there? How many of you would give me $12,000 if I returned 47,000 to you? Okay, you guys want to do that again? 12 and then 50, good, bingo. That's why I don't stop. I never stop putting money into my plans. But what I am doing is I'm taking money out every single year, 93000 My cash value is certainly going to drop because my cash value is going to go down based on whatever this doesn't make up of that. But by the time I'm 100, if I make it there, I still have 114000 And, you know, this is the thing we never talk about. But if I died somewhere in there, you know, I went out to Jaws and I decided at 60, let's do 68 to surf that wave. And, no, I just didn't make it. Like, what happens to my family? They get paid, tax-free. So that Vivi can surf Jaws later in Daddy's legacy. I'm, I love surfing, it's my favorite thing in the world, so I always allude to that, or go back to that. So that's retirement. Now, let's get to the good stuff. This, this presentation, how much time do I got? 40 minutes. Awesome, this presentation right here that I'm gonna do is brand new. This whole presentation, is everybody liking this so far? Yeah. This is the very first time I've ever done this. All right, so I put this together. We finished it up yesterday morning so that I could present this here. And this is the one thing that gets me fired up more than anything. I was on a plane ride to Utah not a couple weeks back, and I was coming home. I'm reading the most dry and boring book ever. It's called How Privatized Banking Really Works. Title sexy, the book. Man, good luck. But I get to the very end of the book, and it tells me you can get paid for driving a company car. And it, it just gave me that idea. And that idea was this. Imagine what Brent showed you, because now I'm gonna come back to Brent. Now we're gonna go into the policy. Imagine you take a loan out and you use that loan to buy a BMW M4, right? This is what Brent showed, really, getting all the money back for all the cars you're ever gonna buy, drive, and own. So BMW M4, nice car, pick any car you want. It can be this. We're gonna, it's gonna cost us 5%, we're gonna purchase the car. But how many, in, how many of you in here have a company? How many of you in here that have a company look for write-offs in your company? And your CPA makes suggestions, okay? One more question, how many of you lease a car for the tax write-off? One person, here's a book. Whoop. Get right back there. So he leases a car because he wants a tax deduction, but again, how many of you lease cars in here? You can, that's it? Really, only a couple people leasing? This is a different group. All right, anyway, you guys might not like this as much as I thought. <laughs> so what if all we did, instead of leasing from a leasing company, right? You go to the car dealership, why do you lease a car? Some people would say for a tax write-off, only one. Other people would say, why? What is the biggest thing you get with leasing? No a low, no headaches, a lower payment, a new, a new car. car. Every three or five years, every three or five years, you get a new car. Why do we buy new cars? Does anyone, can anyone tell me why we buy new cars? If anyone can tell me, I'll give you 20 bucks. You 
You guys are lying to yourselves. Why do you buy new cars? Really? Wait, who said that? $20. You buy, I'm going to give it to him because he got the right answer. You buy new cars and lease new cars for one reason and one reason only. Let me demonstrate. You go to the dealership with you or your wife. You get in the car. You sit down. You shut the door. You go, oh. It's the new car smell. Every single time, that is why you buy a new car. So I can't believe nobody got that. That tells me that you guys are not watching my stuff on YouTube. So write this down real quick before we go any further. My YouTube channel, I give everything away for free. It is at the Chris Noggle. It's very simple. N-A-U-G-L-E. Subscribe and watch any video you want. They're all free, and I teach you how to do everything from getting all the money back for the cell phones you buy straight up through, uh, you name it. It's all on there, okay? So now let's keep going. So we buy new cars for the new car smell, so we want a new car every three years, but when we do that, we give up a lot of money to the leasing companies, to the financial companies. But let's change that. And all we're going to do is one thing, okay? We're going to lease this car that we just bought with our banking policy, and we're going to lease it to our, I got, let's see, I need my little red line. Thank you. All right, we're going to lease it to our company. Our bank bought the BMW, and that would be fine because we know we can get all the money back for this car, right? But now what we're going to do is we're going to then have our attorney draft a lease. Very simple, simple legal agreement. And we're going to lease this car to our company. And then what are we going to do? We're going to drive the car. And what is our company going to do? Just like it does now if you do a company car, it's going to pay the bank. Whose bank is getting the payment? Your. Your. Did we miss anything as to why you would lease a car? New car smell, lower monthly payment. What was the other reason? No headaches. Okay. Once you do a lease agreement, you just change a couple words. So let's look at the financial impact of what this actually would mean. Do you guys want to see how this would look from the numbers? Because this blew my mind. I swear to God, this is the first time I did this, and I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw this. So let's go into it. And I'm going to pick on real cars that I did. And these cars, I did not use this strategy, so I want to be transparent. This is hypothetical, but the cars are real. Okay, 4-6-2008, Audi A8. Okay, if I had leased this car, now I paid 20 grand for it, in five years, that $20,000 Audi A8 would be worth about $8,000. How did I know? I went on and looked. Simple. I actually, well, I didn't. Andrew and our mapping team, and all of you know what the mapping team is by now, right? It's our back-end office that basically works for you when you start a banking policy with us. They do all this for you. Andrew would do this for you, too. And he looked it up. car would be worth eight grand after five years. An APR. Most of you never see this because your leasing car or the car company you lease from doesn't tell you about that interest rate embedded in that packet of paperwork you signed. But do you guys know that they charge interest on these? Okay, good. As long as we have knowledge. So I used 8%, and my monthly payment for this A8 is 297 bucks. How many of you want to drive an Audi A8 for $297 a month? Bingo, me too. Okay, so if I did this, now I did a term of five years, okay? 17000 would be my lease payments that my company, my LLC, made back to my bank, meaning I basically made $5,799. Folks, this isn't new money, okay? This is money you're giving away today to some other leasing company or some other bank, okay? That's car number one. Car number two, that is my dream car, and I'm sad that it's gone. Audi S4 Avant, that was a beast. If you guys ever want a fun car, that was one. So this is back when I was snowboarding. I had an infatuation with Audis, if you can't tell. I paid 45 for that. Residual value, 18 after five years. APR, 667. So that car could be driven for 667. I'm just trying to paint the picture here, and then we're going to get deeper into this. And then this is her push gift, actually the day we were at the dealership, the Porsche, 63,000. Residual value, that's terrible. Five years later, a Porsche is only going to be worth 25 grand. I'm hoping it's worth more. 8%, 937 a month, total payments, 56. Those are three cars. Could all of you envision like a car that you would want to drive this year, three years, five years, 10 years? You got it. So these are my cars. So get paid to drive a company car. So here's the numbers. The first car, 20 grand with the residual value of 8,000. There's the math that we just did. So what I did, I bought the car with my bank. Now, the downside to this is I had to build my bank up, right? 
Building wealth is a marathon. It's not a sprint. I had to build that bank up first before I could do this. But once it's, once it's there, it's giddy up and go. So here we go. Okay, I made $799 in the process of doing that. Now, what is, I made way more than this, but does anyone know why I'm only showing $799? What's missing here? What return am I not showing? My interest in dividends that I showed you, that compound nature of my policy. I'm just showing you how much money I'm making in pure interest on this deal minus the 5% loan that I took out. Okay, that's all I'm showing you. So plus, I don't know, I mean, an Audi A8, five years from today, does anyone think I could sell that for more than eight grand? Yeah. Probably, right? Yeah. So anything I make above and beyond eight grand is mine. It's my money, right? Mm -hmm. You know who does this every single day? Dealerships. Mm -hmm. Dealerships. They lease you a car. You give the car back happily because you want the new car smell. I understand. You give the car back. They take the car to the auction. They don't give two craps what they get for the car as long as it's above and beyond the residual value they put in the car. This is how they make money. You're just missing it because they did the work instead of you. They're the bank instead of you. That's the only change here. It's the only difference. Okay? So there you go. Real numbers. 18,000. This is a totally different policy. This is uh, my AUL policy, American United Life. Okay, seven years in, 20 grand. I had, had 40,603. I took 20 grand, bought the A8. There's my lease payments, and there's the rest. Okay, so that's the first car. I made deposits of 126. Total lease payments back from my company to my bank, 17,799. Okay, purchase price of the car, so we got to subtract 20 grand from that. 123,799 was my true net injection into my banking system. And in doing that, my cash value after year seven when that car's done is 136, which if we just did the math, I mean this is kind of doesn't matter, 110% I made on doing that lease deal, okay? Gets better, remember? What happens when you age wine? Doesn't it get better or so they say? Okay, well, this is that. Gets better every, t every car I do. Second car, the RS or the Audi S4 Avant. Let's just get into the numbers. Now you see it. I made $17.98 plus the sale of the car, and I can tell you for sure you could sell that for more than 18 100%. So come over here. Here's the numbers. You're 8 through 12. 45 came out. You can see the number went down by 45. Lease payments went back into my policy as loan repayments. There's the numbers. 68. Total lease payments were 40. Purchase price was 45. 63,000 net injection. I mean, it starts getting silly, so we could just... That just doesn't even look real, does it? Just doesn't. So just look at the number. That's how much cash I have. It's right there. And Larissa's push gift, if this was the sequential order in which it actually happened, would be right over here, $2,480, plus the car sale proceeds and the numbers. Okay, 72. Now remember, I was doing 18. 72 is the max I can put in now. Okay, so my numbers just get better and better. I have 347 at the end. And I'll just put the numbers up there for you. 36,000 was all I deposited. 56 were the lease payments from my company. Oh, did everybody catch that every one of these lease payments was a complete tax write-off to my LLC? Everybody understands that, right? Now, some of you are saying, yeah, but Chris, you paid that money back to yourself, so you had to pay tax on that. Ah, indeed. But if you've got a good CPA, I'm sure they can figure that out. That's the full lease payment. Yeah, I mean, any CPAs in the room? I'm not a CPA. I can't give tax advice, but I do have a CPA, and I asked him about this. He said you can write the lease payment off 100% to your company. Correct? Okay, there we go. Great question. It's just an expense, right? It's an expense of the business. Anyone, can anyone here operate your business without a vehicle? In today's world, can anyone here operate? Exactly. It is a mandatory need to run a business of any type, I think. I'm sure somebody would call, me, call my bluff on that. But anyway, there you go. 435,1400. So here's the summary and kind of the wrap up on this, but then I'm going to show you something cool. You guys are, how many of you are traders in here? Okay. So I have time, so I actually put a bonus round in here, and I'm going to show you how to use this for trading. I'm going to show you how I use it and how my, I actually have a full time trader. I hired him from, um, where do you work? Goldman Sachs. Just hired him in January. I couldn't, you guys are good option traders because you pay attention. I'm too, I'm too busy. And I traded professionally for over 20 years, but I was the worst trader on earth because I wasn't watching, I wasn't paying attention, I broke every freaking rule that's back in that little office back there. Every one, every time, because emotions. And when you work on Wall Street, you're taught one way, and when you actually do it yourself, it's the right way. The way we did it, the way you do it are different. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you that. Anyway, 
get into this. Sorry, I'm going down a rabbit hole. So here's those three leases, and here's the summary. Total net gain, $5,077. Not bad. It's more than what you guys do today. And all the profit from selling those cars, right? I could sell those cars for more than that residual value. Your dealership does that every day. Plus, I didn't have to pay $37,000 plus in interest. How do you guys like my way of leasing cars? <laughs> Pretty good. All right. All right. So now let me, I have time. So let me hit like three questions. Anyone have any questions on this before I move on? And I'm out of books, so I don't have any more free so, goodies. Um, the net gain, that's um, after the, the seven years. Like when Correct. You get back. Okay. Yep. All right. And that's cool. after the 5%. So what we did is, you can see we put it there. Okay. We took the, the lease interest minus the policy loan. Mm -hmm. So I'm literally showing it worse than it actually, you'd be making more okay. because I didn't include any of the interest or dividends from the policy. Gotcha. I gotcha. just wanted to kind of show it as low as I could. Yeah. That's how we did it. Oh, thank you. Come over to this side. When you're saying your bank, is that a professional organization or LLC, or is it just it's just the policy? It's just Chris Noggle's bank, wow. and it's uh, just conveniently has the name of an insurance company, and I'm the owner of that insurance policy. That's all it is. I mean, hey, we make it sound good, but you know what? You're doing exactly the same thing as a bank is, because that's what banks do every day. That's why they have so many vice presidents. If you get a look, if I ever were to do a call, I always mail a thank you card, and in that thank you card is a little. How many of you have seen a VP at the bank? Don't they have a little badge that says vice president of janitorial, vice president of lending? They have a vice president for everything. Does anyone know why they have vice presidents? It's an, no, it's an insurable interest. It's an insurable interest. They need an insurable interest for that executive, so they bump them up. Oh, oh my God, you rock. Look at you. There it is. BYOB, VP of cash flow. This is what we mail. She's got it because she did a call with us. So... That's why banks do it. They, they upgrade you to a VP, they give you a deferred comp, a small death benefit, and they take a big old life insurance policy out on you. Yeah. What? Yeah, earlier, um, I'm, I'm gonna go back to, um, somebody asked about um, selling a property and the, taking the proceeds and yes, rolling sir. that into the account. So that's considered capital gains, right? Is that, is that a tax shelter from that? In the capital gains are now listen i like, just wanted to make sure unfortunately what we're talking about with being your own bank i give you no taxable benefits no, I, I up front i understand that but, they said it was tax free and oh the, all the gains so all that money this is the wrong slide but remember all that money i was making those those cash on cash mm -hmm. returns all of that money is 100 percent tax free but the sale of his property he's got to pay capital gains on that okay. but when he puts the money in here the four percent it makes so let's just use the guaranteed four percent so that 100 he put in, the next year he's got 104. Does he have to pay any capital gains or taxes on that four grand? No, that's tax free. No, just keep the Correct. And four and gone. yeah, just keeps going. Yep. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, let's go all the way in the back, back here. I noticed that a lot of the numbers you were putting up is ten, twenty thousand dollars. So that means you have to be able to start up with that every year. Okay. Do you remember when I said my first policy? How much did I say I was putting in? You was doing two something? 200 a month. Yeah. Yep. So the, here's the easiest way to think of it. You guys can write this down. The minimum to do everything I'm showing. My numbers are my numbers. Yours will be yours. The minimum is how old are you, sir? 49. 49 years old. What's 49 times 10? <coughs> That's 490 a month. That's your minimum. Take your age times 10 that will give you your minimum monthly to make this work. Any less than that, we probably won't build the plan because it just won't work the way I show it. That help? Awesome. What happened to somebody who, who bought their cars? Can, they, can this uh, leasing option uh, work for somebody who has purchased their cars? Yeah, now, they have the company? can I ask one more question? Yeah, sure. That car you purchased, did you take a loan out for it? Yes. Perfect, okay. So he's asking, what about somebody that has already got a car? And they already have a car loan. Like, can this work? Absolutely. Let's just say, I mean, the wrong example. Let's just say you put enough money in your banking policy over a couple of years. You take the loan from your banking policy. You pay off your car loan. How much is your monthly payment, if you don't mind? 450. So he's giving 450 to somebody else's bank. So he takes a loan from his bank, pays off somebody else's bank. Okay. Now that 450 you're giving to them, where does that go? Back to you. Okay, so now you did first part. Now, your LLC, do you have a company? Yeah. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that car that is bought and paid for from your personal bank, okay? And we're gonna lease that to your company. 
And instead of 450 a month, you're going to figure out what you want that lease payment to be. We will help you with that in the mapping team because we have a, a lease calculator. You tell us, all right, in three years, uh, this car might be worth this much. We'll put a residual value and we'll, we'll lower the monthly payment because the car's already bought and paid for. You follow what I'm saying? So you absolutely can do that. But again, I just want to be transparent. You do all understand, like, there's no hocus pocus here. This isn't a get rich quick scheme that we're doing here. This is going to take time. So it would take you time to build your bank up to where you have enough money to pay off that car. But that's the hardest part because from that point, Every single year, every single month, every single day, this will work better and better as it goes, okay? All right, one more question, then I'm going to do the trading, and then we're going to come and I'm going to answer all your questions. I have a question. My daughter has a car right now in the middle. Uh, hold on. She, oh, sorry. John. I'm sorry. Um, if I start with the, I'm 55, 550 a month, okay. can I change that to move higher no, later? No, you cannot. So another policy if that all of a sudden correct. that changes. So remember, okay. we, we talked about the ceiling. So if you started at 550, that's your ceiling. You might be able to go 560 into it. I don't know. It's going to be close because we build them right at that limit. You can always go down by 60%, but you can never go higher than that. Okay, and then can we give Adele? I know she's got a loud voice, but we'll, we'll do the mic for recording. Well, we have people watching on Zoom. Hi. My daughter's at the point right now, she's in, in about a month. She's going to have to turn over a car to a new lease. So this, how could she be able to do this? You know, should we take out a, a like the insurance plan? Because I have the money I could take out. And I want her to do the same formula like you did. Yep. So can we do that? And that will help her with her next lease? Absolutely. But you know what the best part is? How about, because it's you and this is your daughter, and I know you love your daughter, but like let's teach her something. How about you be the owner of the policy? You control the policy. You lend the money to her, and she pays lease payments back to you. Oh, of course, she has the money, too, but I mean, you know. Well, all <laughs> right. You. I, you're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Uh, let's see. Am I okay? Time? I just want to make sure I get through this. Good. Uh, Mike, one more, and then I'm going to do this. Real, this is only like three slides, but you guys will really like it, and then I'll answer questions. Oh, I got plenty of time. Sure. I can actually do more. Okay, so I'm 37, so... You're saying the maximum I could pay would be 370. Minimum. 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 Okay, so I can do like a 50 grand million dollars a year if you want. Dump. I could dump 50 grand into a policy like that and start my bank mm -hmm. like immediately. Yes, sir. Okay. We do it every day. Every single day we have real. I, I work very heavily with Brent and Hannah and our entire team with real estate investors. Like, if you look us up and you start following me, you'll see like because of my background in real estate, because of the HGTV show, we do this for a lot of real estate investors. And why would a real estate investor want to do this? Because it just makes bloody sense. That's why. So yes, you could absolutely do that. So what Glenn said is, if he did 50 grand. Would his premium every year be 50 grand? The answer is whatever he wants. He could do 50 grand the first year and then do, I don't know, let's say a thousand bucks a month every year thereafter. It's up to him. He designs the plan around what he wants. So if he wanted it to be 50 grand a year, he can. It's up to him. We, we design the plan specifically for your needs and goals. That's it. We solve your money problem because every single one of you has a different money problem. So every single one of you, your policy will look completely different than the prior person. Yep, one sec. <laughs> in in uh, the government changing the, the interest payments, that they're, they're, well, make you know, forcing it or whatever, do you see them doing it for years or two years or did no. just do it once in a blue? I think you might have lost it. So he, what he's saying is, you know, the 7702, which is the IRS ruling they just did that's going to allow insurance companies to drop the guaranteed interest rate, that's because we're in a low interest rate environment, and we probably will be into the foreseen future with this administration. We'll probably keep low interest rates. So what they did is they're just trying to protect giant insurance companies because if the insurance – folks, let's be very clear about something. If the insurance companies in this country or world went down, it's all over, folks. It's not the banks. The banks get the money from the insurance companies, not the other way around. So the insurance companies just wanted a little breathing room because if they're buying 30-year uh, treasuries at, let's just say, 2.2%, and they're paying you 4%, they can make that difference up on the tailwind they have from prior 30-year treasuries, but you know, eventually that's going to that's gonna strain them. So they're just giving them the ability. Now, the insurance companies we work with, we've had talks with them, don't have any solid numbers. 
they're all thinking this is actually going to be somewhat of a positive thing. Because here's what they're thinking is going to happen. The guaranteed rate's going to go down. So I wouldn't say any of you should wait because this is an unknown. And do any of you like the speculative unknowns? No, you like the things that are right now in front of you. So, but what they're saying is when they do decrease that guaranteed interest rate, it's going to increase the MEC limits. Meaning, like if we, if he wanted to put 50 grand into his plan, and then he wanted the ability to put uh, like a whole. The, the, I'm trying to think of the easiest way to explain it. There's a limit on how much we can put in because of the MEC rules, and it's pretty tight right now. So if he put 50 grand in, we'd have to put in like, I don't know, what, 10 grand a year? Yeah. 10 grand a year. When this happens, he might be able to put 50 in and then do like $500 a year or $500 a month. It's going to widen that gap. The second thing that's probably going to happen is every number I used up there was a 5% interest rate that the insurance company charged, wasn't it? I can tell you right now, like, that's the highest that we have on any of our companies. We have companies in the fours. And when this happens, they're saying that the interest rate on those loans is going to drop too. Is that good for what we're doing? If we're using money every year, wouldn't it be better to pay the insurance company less? And the last thing is they're saying that the dividends, because the companies will have more surplus money because they're paying less guarantees, will be higher. So you got to remember, there's, there's regular whole life that's a death benefit. Most people that have a whole life never take money out of it. Statistically, if people have a whole life policy, they build cash flow, they never even take money out. We're using the money all the time, every time. We're, we're putting it in and taking it out, putting it in because we're moving it. So the people that are putting it in are the ones that probably will not benefit from this and just leaving it there. For us, man, it might be Christmas all over again. I don't know, but that's speculation. <laughs> did you forget the question? I did. Um, oh, so the 4%, once you initiate the policy, that's going to stay for the life of the policy. Yes, sir. You're grandfathered. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the other question was, Brent has 19 policies or whatever he's got. They're not all on him. Nope. And how many can he have on himself? I don't it, it's It's not a number of policies. It's the it's amount man. of coverage on his life. Right. So... The calculation, the human life values, is how much money Brent makes in income, his age, his health, and the assets that he has. And then they're going to say, okay, based on those factors, here's the amount of death benefit he can have. That's the thing. But as Brent get, you know, keeps going, he keeps making more money, so his human life value keeps going up. Yeah, that's Thank all. You. Hmm? Um, thanks. Um, so what happens, so, you know, we, we, you know, as a continuation of his question, so if... Um, the folks that, that Brent has on um, insured pass before, oh no wait, if he passes before the folks on his policy do, right? What happens to that policy? Does yeah, that, it's that easy. He probably, he, his policies are probably owned by a trust or he has successor owners on his policies. So if he dies, life goes on. He, the, the beauty is, is once you set this up and you get to that level, there's going to be some trust planning, and the trust is essentially your rules, your wishes when, you're, you, when you've graduated. You know, they're just your wishes from the grave. Yeah. So, yep. Get back here. Or did we have, yeah, okay. We'll, we'll uh, do this one first. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I have a one-year-old son. Um, am I able to create a custodial account for him? It's not a custodial account, but you just created, I, I did a policy on Vivi. She's 10 months old. I did it when she was seven months old. Okay. And I own the policy on Vivi. Okay. She's so you just, you just add, you add money into that and mm -hmm. it accrues interest over time. Yep. And then when she or my son turns like a certain age where they're able to, I'd say 21 because 18, like it's not a good time. Sure. Um, like, yeah, even 25, honestly. Um, that's when maybe they be 30. able to pull it out. That makes sense? That's when you could change ownership over to them. Okay. But the one thing I'd really highly advise, don't ever wait. Don't wait. Start the policy for your son. Okay. He's one, so maybe a bit early. Start teaching him how to use his money the way that the banks do. Start showing him how to move his money. So, you know, teach your son how to find out something he likes. And let's say, hey, son, let's open a business. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to go to your bank that I set up with you for you when you were one. We're going to take a loan from your bank, and we're going to open your let's just use a lemonade stand and we're going to fund the lemonade the cups and the marketing and we're going to do a fifty thousand dollar marketing campaign and we're going <laughs> to joking but and then when well, we're going to take all the money from that and we're going to roll it back into your bank start teaching your children how money works so that when they get to our age they will be so far ahead we can literally change the entire dynamic by teaching people the truth thank you you're welcome yeah thank you for that so my question is um, 
I'm like 100 years old. So um, You don't look 100, so you're doing pretty good, man. <laughs> so when you get to an older person, is it better to have policies in, in your children's names or your grandchildren's names? If I may ask, how old are you? 71. I'll be 71. No, we, how old was Claire? 74? 74? No, we could do it on you, but we'd, we'd have to look at it. If there's health issues. No which, health issues. Oh, well, then why wouldn't you just do it on yourself? Okay, that, that, that's what I need to yeah. know. Matt, yeah. I don't know if Brent said it because I was outside talking, but in these plans, it's not, I know you think life insurance is the traditional way, but these plans, the amount you're going to have in the plan would be the same whether you're 43 like me or 70. It's just basically the death benefit for you would be significantly less. Which is not the main factor that we're No. But, I mean, it might make sense for you to do it on a child. I mean, there's right. different reasons for that, which we would talk about on a call. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Great question, though. Maybe one more, and then we'll do tale of two traders. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good teaching. Um, question. And to pick, yes, to piggyback off of the question he, the gentleman asked, reference to setting up the account as the account holder, the short holder. Yeah, it is pretty quiet. It might be the mic. Yes. Piggybacking off of the question the gentleman asked, reference to the, the policy holder, does that count? Does that policy go on probate if the policy holder deceases before it ends? And the reason I'm asking, would it be best to set it up as a trust so it can bypass um, probate? Well, that's, that might be like one of the most in depth questions I've got in any time speaking. It's a great question. I'm because I, I'm yeah, yeah, I'll Good. repeat it. So he's basically just saying if he's the owner of somebody else's policy, and uh, something happens, does it have to go through probate, essentially? And if that is the case, should he do trust planning to avoid that? Did I get that? Correct. No, these bypass probate. So it was an easy answer, I already had. To. And while I've got a little extra time, what is Earth Keepers? Or Earth Keepers? Earth Keepers is a nonprofit organization, do a lot of training, uh, business etiquette for the youth, as well as uh, oh, feed the community. Thank you. Yes. I figured it was something like that, which is why I wanted to do that, give you a plug. Yeah, and I, I'm so, now that I have a daughter, I'm so passionate about teaching children how money works. We were launching something called Money's Cool, and it's eventually going to be a children's line of books all around, like, my cat, Scout, and Scout's going to be scouting for money. So thank you for doing that. Ten minutes. All right. So let me, let me do this, and then I'm going to come back, and we're going to hit some questions. This will take a couple seconds. So uh, let's see, a little red dot line. Thank you. Got it. Awesome. Thanks, man. All right, so this is something we did for a training. Oh, actually, so you guys know what I look like, but this is Sodi. This is my trader. He, he works for me full time. He's in Salt Lake City, and all he does is trades my accounts because I'm just not capable anymore of trading my own accounts. So here's how we did this. Remember that $18,000 plan? This is a true example. What I did is, and back in March, you guys remember what happened last March? COVID. Yeah, but what happened when COVID hit to the markets? How many of you bought last year? Okay. How many of you wish you would have bought last year? Okay. Why did you not? No, no money. Okay. Right. Okay. That's usually the answer. Some people are going to say fear, but you, you, if you're here, you're probably over the fear part because I'm sure Larry beat that out of you. So anyway, <laughs> what I did, and true, true story, and I'm going to show you the real trades. 18 grand. Back in March, I think it was March. I'll show you the date. In March, I looked at Tesla, and Tesla dropped about $415. I'm like, wow, cars, rockets, Mars, cool, let's buy that. So what I did is I, right here, this was my plan. This plan's pretty old. I have 14 years, I had the money, okay, even though I was using it, but I took 18 grand from my plan, and there's my trades. Now, I'm, I'm embarrassed to show this because I literally bought six shares. I was scared, I'm not going to lie. I bought six shares at 415, $2,490. Now, here's my actual trade. Anyone know what platform this is off of? You guys should know this. Yeah, TD Ameritrade, think or swim, okay? So there's my buy and sells, okay? You can see there's my six open and my six close. So I held it till 512. That thing ran to 3, 832, and I'm like, oh, man. Now, how many of you, when you trade, have a set of rules for your exits? Perhaps I, listen, I'm just fortifying what he's teaching you to make sure you guys are actually paying attention. I also do. And when it hit 832, I was way past my exit. And I'm just like, this can't get any better. So I sold it. And I made $2,507. Is that a good day in the office? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And some people, when I show this, are like, oh, you should have held it. No, actually, I shouldn't have. Nope. I really shouldn't have. I should have sold it sooner because I should have followed my rules. But I already told you that's why I hired Sodi. 
Okay, next one. I got mad, and I'm like, damn, I should have bought more. So I went in again, $30. Now, anyone remember what happened to Tesla around September? Split. Split. Right? So I was able to pick up more shares at 338 so I bought 30 shares. And now I used almost all the money. Now, TD Ameritrade screwed me. They didn't fill me 100% at it. Now, that, that was one trade. They didn't fill me, and I had to go back in and buy it. it I don't know why, but they do funky things. So I bought for 17 and then down here, you can't really see it, but just come down here to the close. I sold 50 shares of Tesla for 423. Pretty darn good day in the office too, right there, 23%. And how many days went by with that? Nine, well, let's just go from 9.9 to 9.21. That's, that's awesome. I was like, yes, got it again. And then I'm like, shit, I should have should have kept it. So again, 9.24, I went back in at 14. I bought them at 380. And then I eventually sold them at 424. It trades again, 11%. These trades are just, I mean, in, in the real, otherwise, if I was making this up, I would have put about 1,200 shares. But you <laughs> yeah. get the drift. I just, I didn't go enough but how we do our trading is we do it in very small chunks when we take a trade we have a specific size that we will take on any one position and these all well except for one of them they all fit that size so i was just following my rules but only reason i wanted to show that whoops only reason i wanted to show that is i was able to do this for one reason and one reason only and that is because i had the money in my bank i was my money i wasn't relying on someone else to be in control of my money now let me give you an example of control in March, when this whole thing crashed, yeah. banks got nervous. Banks had liquidity crises, or so they said they did. And banks started to pull back on what they allowed people to do. Did anyone in March, April, May, or June go to your bank and ask to take all your money out? Anyone? Well, you're, they weren't closed, but you wouldn't have been able to. The bank would not have let you take all your money out. I had people that did this, and they were only able to take 3000 Some banks allowed 5000 And the person's like, I have 500000 in. Can I just have my money? No, I'm sorry, sir. We can't do that. Banks actually, during that period of time, had like branch trucks pull up, bringing bags of money in so that there wasn't a run on the banks. You guys should read The Creature from Jekyll Island if you want to understand why the banks do what they do. It'll scare the hell out of you. You should just go right to the very last chapter of that book, start there, and that'll tell you what's probably coming in real estate, and then go back to the beginning and finish it. But I was in control of my money because my money wasn't held at banks. The insurance company never said when I clicked the button online, they never said, Chris, we can't give you the 18000 Sorry, man, it's COVID. Like, we're, we're, we're working remotely. No, there's never a question. There's never a credit check. There's never a form to fill out. I want my money. I get my money. That is the equivalent of control. And if that's not how your banking is operating right now, you need to change one thing, folks. That's a wrap. Let's go to questions. I think we got like five minutes, so I'll get as many as I can. Yes, Glenn. And thank you for driving out today. Yeah, no worries. Um, thanks for being here. Chris, We about 45 minutes ago, you had 30 grand up, and you were trying to put it in your policy but you could only fit 12 grand then we talked about taking 18,000 segregated account yeah, just go close to your mouth sure. yeah and taking 18 grand going uh, into your segregated sure. account <clears throat> with the possibility of then opening up a second policy what is the window of that uh, before it becomes taxable so what what when what becomes taxable 18,000 that you said you would move over into your checking account. That 18 grand, I, all the money that goes into my policies is after tax money. Think of like a Roth IRA. So all that money is after tax already. So I had already paid tax on the 18. That money was just after tax that I just put in. Okay. But just so everybody knows, that 18 grand that I put into the segregated account, that was fictitious, made up, hypothetical for a simple way to explain it. I never in a million years would have done what I showed because what I would have done is taken that 18 grand and ran right out, called Mr. Brent Kessler and opened another banking policy. Actually, I would have just called myself. It's pretty fun calling yourself. Anyone ever do that? <laughs> yes, uh, Chris. Oh, I can't believe I got you on the phone. Yeah, no problem. Uh, how can I help you? I'd like to open another banking. You get the drift. So. Hey, Chris. Um, okay. Where are we? Okay. So you have to, when you take out a loan, you have to finish paying that whole loan for whatever the years it is before you're able to borrow. Absolutely false. No. No, you can take money out anytime you have money in there. It doesn't matter how many loans you have. The insurance company could give two craps how many loans you have. And they'll never ask you for the loans to go to be paid back. Okay. 
Yeah, th there's a death benefit. So when you take loans, the insurance company is giving you money from their general account, and all they're doing is on their computer screen, whatever the loan is, they're subtracting it from your death benefit, and you're good. But, I mean, we don't teach that. We teach you putting the money back in your bank because if you owned a grocery store, you wouldn't steal the peas from the shelf, would you? No. <laughs> You'd pay for the peas. So don't steal the peas from your bank. Would you recommend opening a... Uh, Where am I at? Oh. Oh, sorry. Would you recommend closing um, your mm -hmm. 401k? Oof or borrowing money from your 401k to open a whole life of that magnitude in order to do business? That is a great question. He's, he's basically saying, should he close his 401k or take a loan from his 401k? The answer to that is maybe, but I'd like to have a talk because I don't know your circumstance. And if I just say yes, everybody's going to do that, and then it's not going to go well. Some people, that is a terrible recommendation. We don't even tell people to stop putting money into their 401k because if you get a match, you're getting a match from your 401k and you put three in and they give you three free, I'm sorry, like Brent and I are good, we can't give you free money. Well, I, Larry took my money today, but that was about as close as it gets. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm still confused about, you know, Brent having like 19 policies. So um, the first one would be under you, but then you could be the owner of somebody else's, is that correct? Correct, remember the, the VP of bank, that, remember I did that? Yeah. Okay, the bank is the owner of that vice president's policy. Okay, the think that way, think owner. like a bank. Always okay. think like a bank. You can be the owner, do you have any partners in your real estate company? No. Okay, if you did, let's just say you took out a policy on your partner, there's an insurable interest, because if your partner graduated too early, can anyone repeat what graduation date is? Thank you, die. Okay. At that point, when he graduates, you would have a financial need, a loss. So that would basically be what the money would pay out for. Okay. Children, you have an insurable interest in your children. No, no, no. no I'm just saying, you oh, would. Okay. Your, your spouse, you would. You may not have any insurable interest at this point, so yeah. we might have to create one. So pick somebody in the room and go create a partnership, and then we're good. Okay. okay? All right. Thank hey, you. Chris. Chris, about paying what well, you percent that was just oh okay so what he's saying is remember I showed every time and I did that intentionally I showed the loan being paid the loan interest being paid to the insurance company he's saying I don't have to pay the loan interest to the insurance company that is false you do so the loan interest that the insurance company is charging you you're always going to want to pay that every year if you don't because you're just not being an honest banker well no you sh you don't have to pay the loan back but you have to pay the loan interest. But does, can anyone, does it matter if you pay the loan interest or not? Didn't you already make money? Yeah. If, you're, if my policy was making me six in the first year and I gotta pay the insurance company five, how much am I making? One. Is anyone making 1% from your bank right now? Okay, second round. Is anyone making 1% from your bank when you took all the money out of your bank? Okay, there you go. Always pay the loan interest. Yes. All right, Chris. I think we're good. So I, before you go, I just wanted to explain, I wanted you to have uh, an explanation of your watch. Oh my God! I always use this in speaking. I'm getting rusty here, I folks. I know. Luckily, so I what? Have to what time you. is it right now? Anyone can tell me really the time. Just really quick. We have to go, but I want Three to see if you can it's wrap not. it up. The time is now. It's always the right time. I wear this watch when I speak because it always reminds me the only thing that matters is the now. So if you guys want to change your financial futures, the time starts right now. Yes, it does. Woohoo!